Hola niños, this is Pain from Young Justice Legacy, and you're listening to Whelmed the Young Justice Files. Recognized Uncle Walker D zero one. Recognized Emily of Arden D one two. Recognized Chris Jones D one one. Initiate comic commentary part two. Oh my gosh! All right, well we have some more things to ask yeah. about. Um, yes, um, we actually had a uh, one of our um, Patreon backers, David Renard, had a question. Yeah. Um, and he said, has any of the artwork that you've done, um, I, I think either for the comics or maybe even just fan pieces or whatever, inspired any kind of plot lines or plot points or characters or anything in the TV show or in the comics? Um, Not not inspired plot lines, because as I said, um, it's all tight. Uh, mm -hmm. the, yeah, season two was already well into development by the time I ever even started. Um, if there's anything in season three, Greg hasn't told me. <laughs> Fair. So I'll be surprised along with everyone else. Fair. The the um the this the, there was I was on a panel with Greg at a convention once and I was saying my standard line about how um the characters I drew in the comic that I got to design mm -hmm. I only was designing them because they hadn't appeared in the show um because you know, with the lead time, they'd all been designed already. So it was only if they weren't going to be appearing in the show that I got to design them in the comic because there wasn't a design existing. And I said all that, and Greg is like, well, that's not entirely true. I'm like, what? what? Apparently, in one of the last episodes of the show, from, I'm, I'm sorry, of season two of the show, uh -huh. um, when everybody gathers together and Rachel Ghoul's forces are there, you see his henchman Ubu in the background who had oh, not been right. designed prior to, because he was such a minor character in the episode. Yeah. He had not been designed prior to issue 11 uh, of the comic where I did a design for him. So um, they, they asked to make sure that um, his design resemble what we had done in the comic. Oh, so awesome. I designed Ubu. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll be very curious, you know, there, there is, we certainly dealt with some characters, but some of the villains and a lot of the, the characters that show up in that last uh, plot thread with Killstar um, are, are characters I could see making at least cameo appearances in the show um, at some point. So you did, I, I if know. I remember correctly, you did Brainiac, you did Garad, you did Deadshot. Yep. You did uh, Ubu, obviously. Yeah, yeah Ubu, Tal uh, Talia. Oh, right. And and then, yeah, the whole bunch of the, the extra characters that you see in in that whole Killstar arc. So there, there, was, there were a bunch. It's picking um, nits, but technically you did Matt Hagen too, then, right? Or was that somebody else? Did no, that issue? That Matt. Well, okay. You see, you see Clayface at the end of issue eleven, and then issue twelve was was drawn by a guest artist. Oh, so all the Matt Hagen stuff wasn't me. Yeah, which was frustrating because I would have loved to have drawn that one. Yeah, you should really go listen to the bloopers from that episode of us <laughs> reviewing. <laughs> oh my. I listened the, to the episode, but I have not listened to the bloopers yet. You should listen to the bloopers because Emily nearly uh, killed me with a realization. I almost died of laughter. Um, you should listen oh, to that. I, I will have to check that out now with a, with a tease like that. How could I not? So funny. Anyway. Um, okay. So after, after that question, are there any other, are there any other Easter eggs? Like, so you have the thing that was in the closet oh, that didn't end up go through going through. <laughs> oh, Emily goodness. had mentioned you guys, you had put in some stuff about um, convergence at some point. Like there was, yeah, there was well, I mean, we, were, we were joking about uh, my first issue, page one, panel one. There's actually an Easter egg in page one, panel one of my first issue, issue five. 
the script said that Wally was supposed to be watching something on TV and it didn't specify what he was watching. And so I'm like, all right, I'm just going to draw our convergence mascot. Um, so that, that is, that is the convergence mascot Connie on the screen. Um, and, uh, it, when I was doing the Batman strikes, I snuck a Connie into every issue somewhere. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is not something that can continue for my entire career. I'm not going to do this on every book. I do. Um, but like I said, you know, I'm starting a new series and I, I'm handed this shot of a TV screen with random unspecified content and I couldn't pass <laughs> it up. So I'm trying to think of other individual um, examples. I mean, because I know there's a ton of them. The stuff that's leaping to mind is all the, the Minneapolis stuff, which right. is its own conversation, which we could jump into right now. But I'm trying to think of any anything not connected to that that would be a, an Easter egg. Well, I know like, so Greg, Greg throws a bunch of stuff in yeah. So stuff that's like, okay, on the, the sign at the high school, the play that's coming up, yes. the pajama game is something that he clearly specified because he's, I don't know. I, I'm, I still know what the answer is, but after we mentioned it on the show, he was like, pajama game. Come on guys. It's obvious. And I'm like, uh, superheroes and tights, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. So he still hasn't clarified for us, but like clearly he put it in on purpose. Same thing with like Streetcar Named Desire and the Giant Snake and like, you know, these things that are the, uh, what was it? Oh, Godspell, um, Godspell with the clowns. Yeah, and the, no, I, and I heard that whole conversation. Yeah, and that's, that's <laughs> Greg being Greg. It's um, Greg being Greg, yeah. It, well, I'm flipping through my books here. The the whole, in the um the Secret Origin storyline with, with the camping trip where they're all telling each other oh, their, right. their origins. You guys talked at length about Miss Martian's completely bogus origin story. Right. I don't think I heard you guys mention the, the the element of it that was her talking about how there was this competition held to see who was going to uh-huh. accompany yeah. um, John. Um, to Earth. John. Or, yeah. Um, that that's Wonder Woman's origin. It was the competition to see who was going to leave Paradise Island. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So she's oh, cribbing God, other it. superhero origins in the story that she's concocting. I love it. I love it oh so much. Gosh. Yeah, it was so fun drawing that, knowing that that wasn't, it wasn't going to be apparent yet that this is a BS origin, but knowing like, yeah, this is completely a false narrative. That's um, what came, earlier on you were talking about stuff like this. And I was like, this is a question I want to ask you is how much did you know? ahead of time um i knew i I so greg obviously likes to be very secretive with stuff shocked he is that way with me as well but i would get let in on things when it was relevant to what i was doing okay um my first awareness of the five-year time skip between seasons one and two came when i got sent a pack of model sheets or an upcoming episode oh, oh, oh. because I needed a model for a specific character and I get the models and I'm, I'm like, Nightwing. <laughs> right. Oh, well, Hello. this is going to be fun. Oh, another, another Easter egg I found um, uh, also part of Miss Martian's origin story. When she describes the, uh, the justice league, her awareness of the Justice League. There's a there's a panel at the top of a page here, which unfortunately these aren't numbered, so I can't say which page. I originally drew the Justice League in their classic Silver Age origin fighting um, Starro. Oh right. And they said, oh, actually we're doing something with kind of a version of Starro, so that can't be Starro. <laughs> so it ended up being this Cthuloid tentacle monster that was being controlled by Wotan. But if you look at the arrangement of the heroes in the shot, it's the same shot it's, as the Starro it's the, cover. It's the Starro cover. Oh, oh that's great. I, I didn't catch that. I have to go back and look. Well, like I said, it, it's altered. So yeah. I wouldn't blame anyone for not catching it. But once you know, you can like look at how all the figures are arranged and like, yep, that was clearly the Starro in, cover. Clearly inspired by. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. I'm oh. just remembering how much fun I had drawing the, uh, the, the, the scene that was, uh, Superboy's imagined uh, fight with with Superman, and just mm. making it as brutal looking as <laughs> as possible, because it's meant to be this kind of apocalyptic doomsday scenario. Yeah, 
Okay, um, actually, that's another question. Yeah. Then did you design Lois? Because that's the only time we see Lois in anything, right? Yeah, I think I must have, but you know, you see so little of her. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's just sort of like, what suit am I going to put Lois in? You know, it wasn't it wasn't right. much of a, you know. No, I hear you. my amazing character design for Lois Lane. Right. You know, so, <laughs> so yeah, there wasn't. I what's mean, your you know, what's your what's your Lois Lane hot take there? Chris? Yeah. It's like yeah, it's Lois. She. She has like a white strip down the middle of her hair or something like. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, but she's she's in like three panels. No, I'm sorry. Four, well, she's in three panel, four panels alive. <laughs> yep. And then goes through the side of a building, and I just can't imagine that was good for her. So you designed Lois Lane debt. to kill her off. Yeah. <laughs> Yikes! Because I, people, while we were reviewing the show, people it came up a couple times. They were like, "Do we even know?" Like. Is Lois even a, I mean, I'm sure she's in the world somewhere, but technically we don't see her and we don't know what Clark's relationship with her in any way is, even if he has, he could be married to her and we wouldn't know because they haven't seen right. it in the show, right? Like we don't, we don't know. And and then we were reading the comics. I was like, oh, she does show up. And so yeah. does Jimmy at one, one of, point. So one of the things is the, the embarrassment of riches of young justice is like what we've seen of the Justice League. Is, is so appealing and compelling, but like when we see them, <laughs> right. like when they God, when they had the meeting talking about whether or not to kick Captain Marvel off the oh, team, so you know, good. like all the stuff we see is so good. And I like the the depictions of the characters so much. I would love an entire series just about the Earth sixteen version of the Justice League, but the show's not about them, right? So it's right. not really appropriate to do a lot with those characters unless it relates back to the team well you know in our last in the last discussion you and i had yeah you, you had said like the secret of young justice that like greg had said something about the secret of young justice is that it's it's a it's a spy thriller with superheroes <laughs> yeah and the other secret is it's not a just about the team like the other yeah. secret is it's the it's it says young justice the story has got a spotlight on the team but it's really about everything in the dc universe yeah, one one of the things i'm hugely impressed that they pulled off so well you know you, you look at something like the 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 teen titans animated series not not teen titans go but the, the the previous one it existed in this little stylized reality where presumably these are sidekicks to somebody but you never really see them or even secret identities they, they just sort of they are their costumed identities and they live in the tower you know this is a a series about teen heroes that they exist firmly in the context of a world with the justice league and the larger DC universe. And yet they manage to not feel like, Oh, you know, if the, if the kids get in trouble, the justice league will come bail them out. Right. Right. The, you know, the, the fact that they managed to, that balancing act really impresses me that, that, you know, they, yeah. they exist with all those other characters but there's not a sense of them stealing the spotlight away from, you know, the heroes that are the focus of the show. Right. I, I, I hear you. And this idea that the way to put more, they found a way to say that the way to put more emphasis on the team was to actually add more characters is not actually, that's not usually, that doesn't usually work out well. And in this particular case, you're like, look, we need to see Superboy in relation to the existence of Superman. We need to see Robin and Nightwing in relation to, in some way to Bruce. And who is this Bruce, right? And, yeah. and and do it so that the team is not in this vacuum. At least for me, because this is the yeah. show, this is the show that I wanted. I wasn't as much into the Teen Titans uh, series because specifically of that vacuum that existed it wasn't really what I was looking for necessarily, though it was hugely popular, you know? So well, and and I, I think we've touched before on. I mean, I I love the way Batman is portrayed in this series. I love that he is a observant, caring character, and not the kind of emotionally oblivious a hole that he often gets portrayed as. I mean, he's he is still dark and driven and intimidating, and all the things that Batman should be. Mm -hmm. But it always bothered me that how can you be the world's greatest detective and be completely unaware of the emotional reality of the people around you? Well, that's interesting. Cause that's definitely like almost a straight call to Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. yeah. But having said that there was, I, I, 
God, I wish I could remember where I read this. I think I just read it yesterday. Somebody had posted something about having to do with Batman. A little bit of control freak goes a long way. Yeah. Well, that's, and I was that, like, that's a really good point. And I've always, I always disagree a little bit with people that think that the primary focus of the Batman character is vengeance or or otherwise wanting to take revenge on the the criminal element i always think of him as somebody who was horribly wounded and suffered loss and now is this great protector figure that is you know one of the reasons why he's emotionally distant at times is if he lets somebody in it's the potential to get that badly hurt again and also the awareness of about himself that once he cares about you, there was nothing he will not do to, to protect you. And I just, I like the fact that this is a version of Batman that we're seeing where uh, he is the most trusting of the team. He is an effective mentor figure. Uh, I mean, he, he's a, he's an effective mentor with everybody, but especially the way you see him relate to, to Dick Grayson, we haven't gotten to see much of him with, with uh, Tim yet. Although we've had those, those great moments with the, uh, the bat family, together where like they don't talk a lot because they kind of are past having to say a lot there's they're just all in sync and in tune and like yeah it doesn't need to get said we know some of those interactions that you get are great and then you know superman dealing with with superboy the fact that he has an issue with it at first and it takes him a while to like figure out how to deal with it but when you think about him dealing with i have been cloned against my will <laughs> like yeah I get why that could take you a little bit to come around, but some fans I know were like, well, he's Superman. He should be fine with it instantly. Like, so, so you complain when he's a boy scout and he's too perfect, but then you actually see him deal with something emotionally and that's not okay either. All right, fine. (laughs) But you know, but you see him come around and then, you know, you get to the point in season two where he's referring to Superboy as, as Connor L Mm -hmm. or Con L. And I'm like, that almost made me cry. (laughs) He's family now. Like, oh my god. Yep. So yeah, love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. And and yeah, you you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't get some of those those relationships if this was a team that somehow existed in a world where the Justice League wasn't out there. Yeah. But none of the no character somehow they put all of these this huge ensemble cast into this show. Yeah. And somehow no character is particularly extra. The only thing I could say is maybe the Hawks because they have no lines and yeah. they keep getting referred to and their design is awesome and we know nothing. <laughs> no. Well, because they don't have a sidekick. Once they get a sidekick, they can have some influence on the story, Rich. This is how Young Justice works. Bam, mic drop, nailed it. There it is. Emily just answered my entire, my five years of Hawk questions. In one <laughs> I, now, I now want to come up with the most obnoxious possible teen sidekick to the hawks you know it's like, we'll, we'll call him the Hawklet. fledgling he's, he's all like you know what up people you know he's just all this <laughs> terrible you know they make jokes about how he gets fed and it's just, just oh terrible. God, terrible terrible oh that's yes. awful i can see the scene and like, they, like he gets introduced and he or she gets introduced in season three and even while he's just like i i can't guys it's just too obvious like I can't even. Wally comes back from the dead to just be annoyed, right? <laughs> or maybe yeah. impulse, his, or somebody's his, going like, "I even Wally wouldn't touch that one." His, yeah, his speed powers are gone, but he still has these like superhuman eye rolls that he's capable of, <laughs> like <laughs> super uh, speed eye rolls. Too funny. Oh yeah. god. Yeah, I guess that all makes sense. I guess. Wait, the lanterns? Did they have any? Oh, they had lines in that one episode where they were discussing. Captain what about Marvel. Guy Gardner? No. Yeah. Oh, so good. And see, these are the other things that were in the show. And I think I feel also got folded into the comic were references to things that instead of making you more confused, made you interested and intrigued. Like if you knew Guy Gardner, you were laughing your butt off at that joke. If you didn't know Guy Gardner, I feel like it would have been like, whoa, who's this guy they're well, talking I- about? And then go look him up. Or something. You know? I think the previous Justice League animated series kind of cracked the code on you can include other characters in kind of a cameo capacity 
right. without having to do a spotlight episode that tells their origin story and introduces them in a big way. You know, you, you can you can you can let the audience know what they need to know to understand their role in the story. Right. And beyond that, it's just it's tantalizing. It, it, it It's added texture. It's you know, you don't need to to, you know. Like I said, you don't need to do an origin story intro for every character. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, Young Justice does that really well where, you know, part of why it feels like such a real well-developed world is that you get all those little references that if you understand the comics history to, to know like, oh, they're making that reference because, you know, great, good for you. But you don't need to know that to follow the story that you're watching right. or reading. What was interesting watching with my wife who had never really read comics at all um, which was proof to me that this story, that the whole, that the show itself was really something that struck with anybody just because of the arc. But there were times where she was like, it's much more interesting to watch it with me. Like if she'd watched it, she would have enjoyed it. But she was like, because she'd be like, wait, what was that? And I'd like, like, what's this guy? Who's Guy Gardner? And I'd pause and I'd be like, okay, here we go. And I'd like talk about Guy Gardner or like, hey, this reference is referencing to something else or you know, those kinds of things. And yeah. being a being a teacher who deals with high school students all the time, for her, like the moment that Super, Superman turned around and like flew off in school, she was like, well, this is not what I was expecting. And yeah. seeing like, you know, Aqualad dealing with his dad issues and, you know, uh, Artemis with, a, you know, a, a disabled mother who had been in prison and how, you know, that motivates people like she she works with um she's a special education teacher she works in a in a co-ed classroom or not a co-ed a um how would they call it integrated classroom so it's like kids who have uh individual education plans and kids who don't so that they can kind of learn from each other and that kind of thing which is fantastic but she works with this wide range of high school students and she was like this show is so good showing yeah. this experience I love like I love the way that they introduce Captain Marvel and use him in a couple of episodes before revealing to anyone who doesn't already know that he's a yeah. 10-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you're a longtime fan of the character, of course you already know that. But a lot of people are experiencing the characters for the first time in this. And so you get the opportunity to do that. You know, you only get to do it once, you know, reveal of, of some of these characters. And uh, yeah, they do. They you know, do I don't so well. I don't think I ever asked Emily this question because I know that's come up in the show before with other people we know. But did you what was your reaction to Captain Marvel the first few times you saw him? I can't remember now because it's been a while. Like there are some things that I remember like. Oh wow, this is a reveal. I don't remember that one and now I kind of feel awful that like I can't pinpoint it down. I don't think I knew. I might have like it might have been one of the random DC facts that I picked up when I just started like obsessively Wikipediaing things because I wanted to understand the show. I was a weird combination of like there were some things I knew and there were some things I had no idea of and they were always like the weirdest things like I I knew Ms. Martian was a white Martian before I was supposed to but I don't know if I knew that Captain like the entire concept of Captain Marvel before it happened <laughs> but I think I remember what happened I think I just accepted it I was like okay that seems about as plausible as anything else on this show. I'll just go with it. Well, you know, if I'm remembering correctly, I think the Halloween episode where Captain Marvel shows up in his awful costume and just wants to hang out with the kids right. is before you know about Billy Batson. No, it is for sure. So you're like, what is this guy's deal? And then once you know, once you're like, he's a 10 year old that wants to spend Halloween with the kids. Right. And like he's, he's rejected because they think he's just, one of the adult justice league members right. who's kind of weird it's like oh god yeah and We're that happened really? in, that happened in the comics too there was a there was i can't remember which episode it was but there was a time there was batman who has not revealed yet it was before that episode that he knew he was like is there a reason you think you should be with the team billy i mean uh captain marvel uh <laughs> yeah. and, Cat, and, and <laughs> captain marvel was like um i guess not <laughs> Just poor Billy. A, poor Billy. It's like, poor Billy. I have no friends. You almost expect Batman to end that scene with, well, let me know when you're ready to talk about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I'll be over that's... here brooding. What a random aside, this idea that, like, they're, they're talking about should Billy be on the Justice League, but the same conversation could be had about the team. Like, yeah. should he be on the team? Like, it's all of them and some random adult 
superhero? <laughs> like, why is he on the team? So he basically belongs nowhere, the poor given, guy. You know, scenes that we never got to see, given given their attitude about um, when they're recruiting Blue Beetle in the comic about wanting right. to, to talk to his family to uh <laughs> like is there a moment where there was the awkward uncle dudley conversation oh because once they find out that billy is 10 you know that, that captain marvel's 10 like uh but uncle dudley well, clearly 10. clearly no. knows right so well, he, i know like, but like so is like... there a point but don't you want to see members of the justice league standing in uncle dudley's living room having that that conversation yeah. with him like so well he's gonna spend some time at the watchtower and uh right well, I, just, uh, I just picture like like bruce and green arrow contact information in case of you know i can see like bruce and captain marvel standing there with Dudley, uncle dudley just looking at bruce going world's greatest detective huh like how, why, how long has it taken you to realize or maybe bruce showed up once he's like okay i figured it out i better go talk to this whoever is their parent first like maybe it was just bruce i I, I, you know they they make it clear that in in the uh the the episode where they're the the justice league is debating this that batman already knew but don't you want to see what that process looks like where it's like okay something's up with this guy did he plant a tracking device on his cape if you plant a tracking device on on captain marvel's Uh. cape (laughs) and he says shazam (laughs) Does the tracking device just go away, and then does it come back? I mean, what was what was this process of figuring this out like? Wow. These are the what? important questions. Yes. Well, I mean, in I mean, Billy flies right into the apartment. Yeah, there's not and, a lot of stealth there. Right. It's not like he's when Dudley's reading. What is he reading? The newspaper or something? And he's like, Yeah. All right, champ. There was a tiger and everything. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and that's the detail he remembers. I know exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, and if anyone that... doesn't know Captain Marvel from the comics, like the tiger is significant. Oh yeah, we we spent a deep dive on Captain Marvel. Yeah. Two uh, two full episodes diving uh, on Captain Marvel. Emily, what were you trying? What were you saying? Uh, but that that panel in the comics of Batman and Green Arrow sitting in Artemis's living room never fails to make me laugh because it's just such a perfect image so thank you for that i tried tried to have green arrow be like casual and conversational i tried to have batman just being a column of black he's just he is just a monolith of like i'm batman even in your room i'm batman (laughs) right (laughs) he's like i'll let ollie handle this one yeah (laughs) right i love it emily did you have any other did you have any other questions we touched on this a little bit but i'll throw it out again because we're just Go because we're just going with this. I was also kind of because we were talking about Easter eggs earlier. I was kind of curious about like how detailed the scripts you would get usually were, and we've talked about how you had a lot of freedom with some things, but like was that the norm or it varied? I mean, as you can imagine, yeah. Greg uh, puts in a lot of stuff on his own, and if there's something he wants to see in the artwork, he he specifies it. I mean, one of the one of the great things about the experience of working on this comic is I've done other comics based on animation or live action properties that you are kind of left to the mercies of Google image search to find reference of what things are supposed to look like. But in the case of young justice, um, because the writer on the book was one of the two producers of the show, which was in active production, Greg would just send an email to one of the people on staff and be like, can you send Chris the reference packet for episode blah, 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 blah. And I would get this stack of, of stuff that were the, you know, PDFs that would be sent to the animation team for reference for these characters and props and, and background locate, you know, backgrounds for locations and all this stuff. And it was just, there, they, there needs to be a coffee table book of all this material because it's just gorgeous stuff. So that That's was marvelous. Cool. As, but as far as as far as Easter eggs, I mean, I would find opportunities to add a few things here and there. I suppose this is as good a time as I need to talk about the Minneapolis stuff. Yeah, for from, sure. Um, what was it, sixteen and seventeen? Is that right? The the so the one of the story arcs that we did the the way Greg explained this to me is there is one plot thread that is taking place in Gotham that Batman and Robin are dealing with. And another one that's taking place in Star City that Green Arrow and Artemis are dealing with. 
and another one in the central city that the Flash and Kid Flash are dealing with. And then they all find out that these three things are connected and lead them to some fourth city. And it wasn't important to the plot where that was. So rather than just using another one of the fictional cities in the DC universe and wondering where that city's heroes were, Greg, knowing that I was going to be drawing it, decided to make it Minneapolis. <laughs> Which is I may, where I live. I may have had a reaction to that in the show when I was like, meanwhile, in Minneapolis. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Because I was and, like, that interestingly specific. <laughs> the two things, the two things about the Minneapolis location that Greg put in the script were uh references to the the Guthrie Theater. Okay. Uh, which is a big theater here. And so all the all the stuff with the streetcar name desire reference and all that was because Greg had written that in. But the other thing was, I mentioned this convention uh, convergence that I helped start. When the, the, the team travels to Minneapolis by Zeta Beam, the building where they, the Zeta station is that they beam into mm -hmm. is the hotel where convergence takes place. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew that we weren't going to be allowed to use the actual branded uh, hotel logo on the building so i just decided that in the young justice universe that hotel has been purchased by the wayne enterprises uh conglomerate of companies so there's a big gotcha. w in the building but you know there's this whole extended sequence with members of the justice league having to deal with this giant cobra that is wreaking havoc through the city uh -huh. and since I knew the area well, I decided that like this is going to actually have um, a set geography to it that works of, of how these scenes link together. So they're going to start here, and then they're going to go here, and then they're going to go here. And we have a lot of uh, skyways in Minneapolis. Uh, they're they're common now, but Minneapolis is one of the first places to do a lot of skyways in its architecture because it gets really cold here. So I just, you know, I decided like, okay, the Cobra has to crush one of these skyways. And we have skyways over Nicollet Mall, where at the time the comet came out, it's been removed now. Uh, we had um, a statue on the spot where in the old Mary Tyler Moore show, she oh. threw her hat. Hat in the air. Yeah. yeah. And so there was a bronze statue of her doing that. It's actually, it was actually a weirdly creepy looking statue. It was not the best likeness of Mary Tyler Moore, but that statue was on that spot. And so I framed the shot so that that statue was visible. So there's a great page where all these people are running in terror, like they're in a Godzilla movie <laughs> from this giant cobra crushing a skyway. And the middle of it is this bronze woman smiling and, and, throwing her hat into the air <laughs> which i knew as i was drawing it like if you don't know about this statue that's just gonna look really weird and i don't <laughs> care if greg can make godspell and clown references you can yeah, well, put mary tyler more into it exactly exactly <laughs> there's got to be at least a little bit of a venn diagram of people who will get it yeah yeah well i mean it's the things you do to keep yourself entertained, right? Yep. Yes. Absolutely. What is there anything else about the comics that you wanted to talk about, about the experience of being on the comics or to doing the comics, the production? Of, actually, I had another question. Maybe, I'll, yeah. maybe, I'll, maybe yeah. I'll lead off with this question. And this is coming from somebody who is not an artist. Okay. <laughs> okay. You are, you were brought on because you have a particular style, right? I mean, I'm guessing they were like, okay, we had this other person doing the comics. They have to leave, and then they brought you on, right? Yeah. And so you, you had it. They're like, hey, the, it, do they pick you because they're like, hey, his style is very similar to this, and then give you the stuff from the show, and then you have to kind of tweak and alter your style to imitate something from the show. Well, like, how do you? How does that process even work? So, uh, the way I first got my foot in the door at DC Comics. I'd been sending samples to Marvel and DC for a number of years and hadn't gotten in at either company. And I'd seen an ad in an, in an industry magazine that Warner Brothers Animation was looking for artists. And 
I did some samples in the style of of the shows they were doing at the time, which were the you know the the Bruce Tim um, superhero shows from the the late '90s and and going into the 2000s, and um, didn't didn't crack that nut either. But I included those samples in the next batch of stuff I was sending off to comics editors, which got seen by somebody at DC that was looking for an artist to do a fill in issue on a book that was drawn in a slightly more cartoony style. Uh And so I got that gig and that put me in touch with editors who knowing I could do that in addition to more mainstream stuff used me on things like justice league adventures and, and other animation tie-in stuff. And yeah, I mean, you, you look at, you know, when you, when you're drawing a comic based on an animated show, you are looking at, um, the artwork from the show, you're looking at model sheets and trying to not only make those characters look on model, but figure out what the design elements are that define that look so that you can create other characters that blend in and look like they're part of that universe. So um, I'd been doing that stuff and the way I got my first regular series at DC, The Batman Strikes, was they announced the animated series, The Batman. And I'm like, well, I know how this is going to work. There's going to be a tie-in comic for it, which they haven't announced yet, but I'm pretty sure it's coming. So I'm going to find out who the editor is going to be on that and try to throw my hat in the ring to, to get that gig before it's even been announced. Right. And they they looked at a couple artists, and I did some some samples, and I ended up getting that gig. So they announced... Uh, Young Justice as an animated series. And I'm like, ooh, I'm going to try this again because I, I actually had met Greg. I had worked with Greg once before. Um, I, he did a um, a 10-page story for one of those anthology books I mentioned that uh, it was meant to be kind of a tribute to the history of Captain Adam, which is why uh, Greg came in to work on it, even though he wasn't doing a lot of comics writing at that point. And it was Captain Adam in the days of him being involved with justice league europe and greg did this shameless pastiche where they're in europe they're in paris they're at notre dame cathedral and these gargoyle creatures come to life (laughs) and fight these members of the justice league and i drew that story and i'd I'd met greg at a couple conventions so i saw he's doing this young justice series and i think oh it would be fun to work on something that Greg was associated with and it'd be good to have another regular ongoing gig. And I love those characters and like, let's do this. And by the time I found out who the editor was going to be, uh, I was told that, Oh, they already had an artist on the the book, uh, Mike Norton, who did the first few issues and, you know, too late. And um, uh, I forget what the, the gap was in time, but I know that they showed like the two part pilot, like as a movie a long time before the it was regular in, weekly it was series started. In, I remember it releasing in November. Yeah. And they did, they did the release, the first two episodes cause I stumbled on it and then watched it. And then it was like, it was like a couple, three months later. I have yeah. to look at, I have to look so at the, my the recollection movie. is that, is that those two first episodes had gone out and I'd seen them and I was like, wow, this is great. I really wish I would have gotten to, uh, work on this but you know oh well <laughs> right and right. and then i get the call from the editor that uh um that mike norton was leaving and would i be interested in coming in and i found out later that they'd actually asked greg if there was someone he would be oh. interested in working with and he'd mentioned my name so between Aww. the fact that i'd already tried to get on it and then greg asked for me that kind of sealed the deal Right. Yeah. That was how I got on onto Young Justice. And then yeah, it's just it's adjusting to a new a brand new art style. One of the things that was a, a pleasure working on Young Justice is not only are the designs by Phil Barassa and his team just wonderful, but it's a real natural fit for me. When I was drawing the Batman Strikes, um, I was trying to work with designs by um Jeff Mitsuda who's got really cool stuff, but it's really not the way I draw. I see. Um, There's some like, I mean, we, we've been overusing the term Venn diagram crossover, but that's, yeah. I mean, it's like, it's something that was like, this is parallel enough to what you, you're kind of naturally 
attuned to that it was not a huge stretch do you did, i mean I'm, I'm assuming it fed back into your current style too like what you learned on young justice informs what you do in in different styles as well yeah i mean it's hard to know how much is specifically young justice but i mean I, one of the reasons i have i keep hearing people describe my art on other books as very clean and yes. and yeah i don't i don't rely a lot on cross hatching or a lot of really busy line art and part of that is just you you know you you do so many uh animation style books where that wouldn't be appropriate and you just you learn to not rely on it uh yeah i just i, I it just it, that kind of affected the way i approach drawing a comics page so even when i do something that is not trying to emulate a specific animation design not trying to be particularly cartoony yeah certainly my my art style is influenced by a lot of the anime uh, animation stuff I've done and um, Phil's designs for young justice are remarkably detailed, uh, much more realistically proportioned. I mean, they're, they're a little stylized, but much more realistically proportioned than is say uh, Bruce Tim stuff, which right. is also wonderful, but much more exaggerated. Sorry, it's having this picture, <laughs> that episode of Harley Quinn and, Poison Ivy, where she's all, I know you, something about that chin. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, covers up, she covers up his eyes and his nose, and she's all, something about that chin. Yeah. I mean, the, as far as art styles, the big thing for me on Young Justice was, um, so on the Batman Strikes, the, the majority of that run was inked by a wonderful inker named Terry Beatty. And I think um, before I took over the inking on Young Justice, most of that was inked by Dan Davis, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm -hmm. And they both did fine work, but there's a certain kind of smooth, brushy, soft inking style that you usually see on animation books. Right. And I, what I wanted to do with Young Justice is I wanted to make this feel like um, this is the look that they had to simplify and streamline to make it animate. I wanted to basically be on model for the look of the show but with more texture and detail than gotcha. what you could put into animated figures. So, uh, you know, I, I guess it's not as obvious to a lot of readers as to my eye in doing it, but like I, the, the first issue I inked was issue 14, the first issue with the uh, Atlantis storyline. And I just kind of went nuts on, you know, a lot of the undersea life and, and things. I was just like playing around with how, how, do I make this feel more like mainstream superhero comics and less like it's a cartoon book? Cause I didn't want it to feel like a cartoon book. Yeah. You were, I mean, you were playing to the strengths of the medium in which you were working. Yeah. And also a uh, personal thank you uh, from me for the details underwater. Personal thank you from me for that issue in general. Yeah, right. I, so I heard first, you one of the first I bought. One. Yeah. The, it, well, it was much aimed at us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And it was, that was a really fun one to do. And the the whole, um, all right, let's talk Super Martian for a second. That whole moment of <laughs> McGann, who's breathing through her gills, feeding oxygen to Superboy by oh, locking right. lips with him. I yes. love the fact that. Oh, now I'm getting that, thrown under the bus. That Greg, and I mean, I don't know, I don't know what combination it was with. I think Kevin Hopps also worked on that. Um, yeah, that sounds great. But between the two of them, they found a way that, like, they, those two characters have their first kiss in the show, but you need to kind of move that relationship forward in the comic as well. So they managed to find a way to do the, a, an alternate first kiss <laughs> for the characters. That wasn't, but was. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's brilliant. Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> Yes, it is. <laughs> like <laughs> trying not to just just like scream and shout over here, but like it's such good storytelling, like both from a writing perspective and from a emotionally compromised teenage girl perspective. Like it's so good. Well, you know, if the if, highest if, compliment if, if right Young there. Justice <laughs> isn't superheroes meant to appeal to emotionally compromised teenage girls, what is it? Emotionally compromised uh, older men. There you go. There you Maybe. go. Not teenage Emotional. girls. Emotionally compromised boys and girls of all People. ages. People of all ages. Yes. All ages All ages book. It's what convinced me to buy comics, so. 
that is wonderful to hear. Yeah. Cannot say enough nice things. That's fantastic. Obviously, we're fans of the of the comics and um, your work on the comics, and we really appreciate you taking time to come on and give us a lot of the behind the scenes and how oh, the process works. It is my pleasure. I, I, you know, Young Justice has been a big part of my life for several years now, and I love it dearly. And I'm so thrilled that it is coming back. And I, you know, Greg and I would love to do more comics together, but whether that happens or not. I am just delighted um, fandom and for myself that we are getting more episodes. That's yes. Normally at the end of the show, we do an artistic license where we recommend like issues or miniseries from DC and other companies that the watchers might connect with. But this time I thought we might do just focus on some of the things that like you're working on now, but also what you've worked on in the past that you are proud of and that you would like to have people check out that maybe you think haven't been checked out as much as. Oh, deserves. well, uh, how kind. Um, well, as I mentioned at the top of the show, um, I'm currently doing my second Doctor Who miniseries. Um, not to say that it's the second Doctor, it's the second miniseries. Right. <laughs> but the the first issue of that is already in store. So whenever this airs, there's at least one out there, if not more. That's coming out from Titan Comics. I had previously done the third Doctor miniseries for the same company. I did a graphic novel last year that not a lot of people saw, unfortunately, called Also Known As, uh, that was written by uh, a great writer of novels and comics and television named Tony Lee, which is, um, I, I never developed a good an, um, elevator pitch for that book. It's It's got elements of urban fantasy. It's got angels and swords and portals and aliens and it's weird check it out all the best things yeah um <laughs> you know and then outside of that you know odds and ends for marvel and dc we mentioned um young justice and the batman strikes um if you really love my uh animation tie-in work i also did some um avengers earth's mightiest heroes for marvel but uh yeah check it out the the Biggest thing about comics I've worked on, and it ties back into Young Justice, is I'm really hoping that in addition to letting us do some new material, I just would be thrilled if the uh, existing four volumes were put back into print. They're all available on Comixology if people just want to read them, but I can't have digital copies available at my table at conventions i can't sign digital copies for fans and some fans just prefer holding a paper copy in their hands so yeah. i would really love to see those get back into print i agree i was actually looking to buy them for my nephew and i it was outrageous <laughs> yeah that's the thing. They're, they're out of print so you know if you can find them they're usually at much more than the original cover price right and right. You, you would think that alone would be indication enough that there was a demand that uh, new printings might be worth doing but yep. yeah we we wait to see <laughs> but we went into detail on why that is yes. complicated earlier. yes well All fingers with, crossed exactly with that then i think we can wrap up this mission and head out of the watchtower i think you were in the cave last time you were here now we're in the watchtower uh, if you, onwards, if you know onwards. well we blew we everything else up forward. so yeah oh, that's true else. oh People Everything blew up. Place. Right. Hopefully the watchtower will be okay in season three. We'll see. <laughs> if you'd <laughs> like to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on our website, crashingthemode.com, on the yjfiles.tumblr.com, and at our email address, whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. Remember, you can also now find us on YouTube, on Stitcher, and on iHeartRadio. The best way to support the show, of course, is to share it with a friend. You can also support us with a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. Leaving a rating or review pushes us up in the search ranks and helps other people find the show. And considering everything we've been talking about for the last two hours, please continue to hashtag buy YJ Comics on Comixology and to buy the show somewhere online until that DC streaming service launches soon. soon. <laughs> we hope. Uh, you can also use hashtag Young Justice Outsiders when talking about season three. And if you want to help us get more episodes, more secret origins, more actual play podcasts, and more of everything else that we do, please consider supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us do even more with the show while getting some great rewards for yourself. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. 
You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. 